Hello, and welcome to another fully live Q&A episode of Hacking with Friends. Today, we have our special guest, Alex Lin, again. Hello. And he's going to be answering any and all non-cryptozoology related questions. Again, we don't have the cryptozoology guy anymore, at least for a while. He's off on a spiritual journey, so please hold your cryptozoology questions, but do give us your hacker questions if you want to know about getting into the industry or if you want to know about our excellent new drone project we just worked on then feel free to ask in the live chat. And also hello to everyone that's already there, especially Zam, it's great to see our favorite moderator there. Um, Alex, you wanna, you wanna talk a little bit about the drone project we've been working on? <clears throat> sure, so uh, Cody and I recently worked on a war flying drone project when we went on this like little weekend excursion to see if we could gather like Wi-Fi reconnaissance around the city and basically see if we could spot like where people were located um, using this rig that we set up. So if you're not familiar with war driving, it's basically the combination of like Wi-Fi and GPS. So that way you can like spot certain devices and where they're located. Um, and just like certain information, Wi-Fi information about them, like encryption, um, device type, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So basically we rigged together a whole bunch of hardware modules to the bottom of Cody's drone. And for the proof of concept that we wanted to do, we wanted to spot uh, we wanted to see if we could spot like me and another friend that we had like set up around a park using this drone setup. So basically, we used an ESP8266 tethered to a GPS um, setup with some more driving software that I wrote in the Arduino IDE. And we were able to successfully detect both devices um, using this rig. Yeah, what was cool about this as well is that we searched an area of about 100 acres in three minutes. And we were able to pretty precisely pinpoint the location of two Wi-Fi devices just by flying over it with like like between fifteen to thirty dollars worth of gear that you could get on Amazon or AliExpress. Of course, like the drone wasn't fifteen to thirty dollars. The drone is like a separate thing. This is just a little module you can put underneath anything that flies. It will collect Wi-Fi and GPS data and kick it out into a CSV file. So we also went into, uh, well, in an upcoming stream, we're gonna go into uh, how you can use this data to map things, how you can use it to identify signal strength and go a little bit more into depth with the information you can derive from this project. But it's pretty cool that you can map such a large area uh, just by flying around and collecting wireless information. So if you have any questions about this, you wanna try it yourself or you wanna see any of the interesting things we've done with visualizations, we've been able to take the information we got from our war flying drone and put it in to, uh, I think we were using Google Colab, mm. and then map it in a bunch of various interesting ways. So uh, yeah, if you guys want to see more about that, please let us know because it was a lot of fun to do. And I think if anybody else has a drone out there and has been looking for an interesting or cool way to use it, you can of course do this, or you could just use the same uh, module for war driving, war biking, war walking, really anything that involves motion uh, and would give you the ability to capture wireless networks. So really, really cool project. And we're probably going to do a custom printed circuit board on it at some point as well. So if you would like to see a really interesting ESP8266 based uh, war uh, walking, driving, or flying module, then stay tuned for that because it's something we're really interested in working on. Um, so yeah, also if you have a question, go ahead and uh, ask in the chat and we can see our first question in the chat is, uh, what's the best way to learn pen testing? Uh, I think you have more expertise in this area. Yeah, so pen testing is just one area within like, you know, ethical hacking that's much more active than a lot of the other areas where you're constantly trying to break into a system, you're, you're, you are using the same sort of tools that an attacker would use and it's a very uh, straightforward way of utilizing your knowledge of computer science, networking, or just the tools that attackers use to go through like the kill chain process until they're into where their target is, they've established persistence, and they're able to do basically whatever they want. So uh, learning the basic steps of this process, learning tools like Metasploit and other tools that are really common for, uh, I guess, like a pen tester to need to use in a particular engagement would be probably the most direct way you could do so. But I would say like most, uh, it's not necessary to go to school for like computer science or anything for being a pen tester. You can just start by learning the tools, learning the way the technology around it works. And I would really actually advise learning some networking. You can get by just kind of learning about the way that these tools work up until the point that you need to engage with lots of computers on a network or find something on a network. Um, at that point, 
networking skills really become useful as a pen tester, dis and I would argue disproportionately so to computer science. Um, I, and of course, there's, there's always exceptions to that rule. But if you're just looking to get into this, then learning the underlying tools and getting a firm grasp of just routing and switching and general networking would probably be your most direct route. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I agree with that, but <coughs> do you have any suggestions for like specific uh, like web exploitation software specifically for like web pen testing as he mentioned? Um, oh, web pen testing. Yeah, so like I'm much more focused on like overall infrastructure pen testing. So web pen testing is gonna be more stuff like OWASP Juice Shop or like other sorts of things that allow you to mm. test out web application uh, flaws, like things that are going to be universally something you want to look for every time you're doing a security check of a, you know, a, a, poten a potential web application or Android application, because a lot of times mm. there's lots of crossover between the way these sorts of things work. So um, I would say there's lots of different, like, kind of like gamified ways you can start learning these skills. And then, of course, bug bounties are a good way to as a one-off, be able to take a real thing that's up and running and live and apply something that you've learned to look for a vulnerability. Of course, it takes a lot of time because you know uh, a lot of the lowest hanging fruit is gonna be found by other people. But if you are persistent and if you're looking through lots of stuff, then you can get started as a beginner doing bug bounties and learning about like web infrastructure. Um, I, I think that would be fine. But I mean, for in, if you wanna be a more like like broad spectrum pen tester, like someone who can also uh, kind of do something once they find a vulnerability in the web application, then if you want to be a little less specialized to just, uh, you know, like web pen testing, then there's also lots of great stuff out there and lots of things you can learn just by, again, like learning something like Metasploit. Mm. There's lots of really good ways to get started. There's lots of um, like websites dedicated specifically towards getting started with these things, like um, CTFs you can set up. Um, I think there's like even a whole Raspberry Pi operating system you can set up hmm. that's like oh, specifically the, exploitable. Oh yeah, the vulnerable, the damn vulnerable Pi. Yeah, the, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a really really good way to yeah set something up. You're totally allowed to attack and then learn these skills on something that behaves like a real piece of networking equipment that's in service. Right. Cool. Maybe we should take our first um, question from the channel. So if you watch our YouTube channel, which hopefully you either are or will, uh, then you will be able to leave a comment that we'll answer on the stream. So if you want us to answer any of your questions, then you can always, I mean, if you're not here in the chat right now, of course, you can always go to Security Forward and leave a comment, which we will pick out right before the show and make sure we include. So the first question is, Alex, can you read it? I bought an ESP spy camera. I also have a Raspberry Pi 4, question mark. Where can I find videos on creating cool projects? Hey, I mean, that's you've a good done setup like, so far. Yeah, you've done like a whole video on the ESP spy camera, I believe. Mm -hmm. Like, um, So we did a couple videos. I think we did them on like Nullbyte maybe even about um, how to set up and use like various ESP32 cameras. Hmm. There's there's actually so many different types out there. There's like the standard ESP32 cam that doesn't have a USB interface, so you have to like plug into it all weird. There's a USB Type C version. Um, there's an M5 stack version that's like hmm. kind of expensive, but has like nice PS RAM and all this other stuff. So like there's lots of different versions out there. But fundamentally, the ESP32 cam is super cool. Um, and if you have a Raspberry Pi, you have basically everything you need to create like a little surveillance system, basically. Yeah. Right, because you can use the Raspberry Pi as a DVR. There's also um, I, Michael did a, a video on like a surveillance system that you can set up using a Raspberry Pi that takes multiple camera inputs. Hmm. So you can also look up that article. Motion um, iOS. Motion iOS is uh, I think what it's called. I just like I, I it, I'm just remembering it off the top of my head though. Uh, but yeah, Motion iOS is something that you can check out that I just remember as like being a really cool project. And of course, you can look up. I believe it's the Hoid on uh, Nullbyte did an mm. article on that. Um, which I thought was super cool. So if you have multiple ESP32 cameras, you can have them all plug, like sending data to Motion iOS and then end up with just like a grid of all the cameras. So if you want to like, I don't know, like put a camera on your cat, put one in your mailbox, like whatever, I don't, you know, um, you can definitely do that. So uh, really cool uh, set of hardware. Also that, that setup that they're talking about, like, I can get the ESP32 cam on a good day for like five bucks on AliExpress, and a Raspberry Pi like is consistently holding out at around like thirty-five dollars. So for like 40, 40 bucks, that's like a 
a pretty cool setup that you can do lots of interesting things with. You could also do, um, so just off the top of my head, you could also do an automated license plate scanner. Um, there's a Raspberry Pi project for that that basically like is able to use the camera to read the license plate, log it, and then identify the type of vehicle um, based off of a, a database. Um, it's really, really cool. So there's lots of cool projects you can do um, with that. Just make sure to use the data ethically. Um, all right, what's the next question? question? Yeah. Okay, from Mikey Riccardi. That project that you guys built is awesome. I just bought breadboard and soldering iron kit. What is the best website for project inspiration? Um, I draw a lot of inspiration from sites like Instructables or Hackster.io or Hackaday.io. Um, most of the projects that I like started out with or like drawn from inspiration from were from those websites and. There's a lot of great resources there to both get started with like beginner projects and also to just like look at more advanced projects that other people have been building. Yeah, I really like Hackaday as well. Um, just because like it's of course their community, their own community is very vocal about how like hit and miss some of the projects they feature are, but some mm. of them are truly incredible, creative and just weird and interesting and give you great ideas. The one thing that I'll say is like I went to the uh, Hackaday Supercon and we got to meet some people who would like go to the Dollar Tree and like take apart like the electronics because they realized that like all the stuff there is um, like actually of a higher value but has been like dumped. Like because there was too much of it, it's left over, it was overproduced or whatever, um, wrong color. So like we would go to the Dollar Tree and the toys there, like the electronics toys are actually have like lots of electronics you can salvage, use, there's like sensors in them. Some of them can be reprogrammed. Uh, reprogrammed. They have lots of LEDs. Um, so uh, I never would have thought of this, but just like interviewing this lady who just would like make cosplaying costumes by taking apart these dollar store electronics, adding stuff to them, um, like salvaging the components was so cool that I went ahead and just started doing it myself. And that opened the door for all these really interesting projects. And people were like, whoa, like where did you get this weird like flying helicopter thing that you've attached the sensor to? It was like, oh, I dug it out of like these angry birds like hovering balls that I got for a dollar at the Dollar Tree. But I, you know, I was able to buy like 50 of them because they're like a dollar each. And I looked online, they're actually, they're supposed to be like 40 bucks or, or like 30, 40 bucks. Like um, at least at some stores. So I was like, oh cool. Like I can get like at least, you know, probably like 15 or 20 bucks worth of like electronics for a dollar and then be able to do all these cool projects and also like maybe make a kit out of them or something because I can buy so many. So for me, it's like uh, sort of like electronics dumpster diving in like the Dollar Tree store sometimes is really cool because you never know what you're going to find. Um, and then also, yeah, Hackaday, I get a lot of inspiration from and also GitHub, you know, like if you mm. see a really good project on GitHub that has a hardware component, um, Alex and I were, were recently inspired by some projects like the uh, Arju Boy and the ESP Boy. Um, because we're working on a hardware design that has a similar button layout and we're like, hmm, like I wonder what someone else has done like for this sort of layout. So going and seeing that somebody else had done a, a, another super similar project with a totally different like goal was really interesting because we developed something for like security and pen testing, but for gaming there was already something kind of similar out there that had some software that I was like, oh wait, I think we could actually port this and then our thing could come with games and like it would be cool. So sometimes inspiration is just looking around, uh, again, on GitHub or on Hackaday and seeing what other people have done with similar hardware to something that you have or something you're considering working with. We have a golden question in the chat. Yeah. So someone wants to know if you're going to make a video tutorial on the Chicken Man game. Oh my gosh. Have you done that already? Um, or no? We did it a lot. We did it a while ago. Oh no, we, we just featured the Chicken Man game, mm. I think, but we didn't do a video tutorial. So we're currently in the process of fixing up the Chicken Man game to work off of this new hardware that we're working on, which means a little bit of code revamping and stuff. So yes, I think we actually will. And we'll be using a really awesome uh, hardware ESP Here design. Is. Can we oh, yes. yeah. show it off? Yeah, so this is uh, one of the designs that we're currently working on that's going to be able to like run games and be able to do some basic interesting stuff. Uh, so this is this is our good friend Nugget. It's uh, ESP based. And uh, yeah, so yes, there will be a guide on using the Chicken Man game. Basically our idea is to have like something like this be able to be the Chicken Man, uh, as as it were. Uh, so you go, so let's say, all right, let me let me back up. Let's say that you and a couple friends want to learn some Wi-Fi hacking. Cool. You got two of these guys. One of them is the Chicken Man, and you can attach LEDs to it, and it keeps score of who's winning. And the other is the Chicken, which is the access point that you're trying to hack into. And throughout the game, this little uh, 
you know, this little guy would be keeping track of who's winning on a NeoPixel strip by like adjusting it like red or, or green or no, red or blue, depending on like which team has more points. So like we're trying to create something that's like interactive, fun, and like lets you know who's winning in real time. Cause like for hacking games, they're often very abstract and it's not very exciting. So creating something that's a little bit more gamified and fun seems like a nice way of using the code that we wrote for the Chicken Man game and making, e making it even easier for people to use um, on a, a nice kind of compact custom setup. So this is currently in its um, first revision. We're submitting a second design today, actually. Um, so you can expect to see Nugget probably in a video coming up soon. Definitely. So we have another question. Um, someone's interested in Arduino and would like resources to start from scratch. Ah, I believe I know someone who is pretty good at Arduino. <laughs> um, I would say, honestly, Instructables has like a ton mm. of resources and like very beginner friendly tutorials on like how to just get started setting up like the Arduino IDE, like how to use the whole platform, how to use different hardware modules, sensors, stuff like that. So basically whatever you're looking for, just search up like how to do Arduino instructables. You'll find a really great tutorial somewhere on that website. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I'm uh sorry, I was just looking at the the chicken man game question. Um Honestly, like I, these little ESP eighty two sixty sixes are so cool and versatile for being able to like um, just create something off the cuff. Like, um, f for example, if you have one of these and you open up Arduino IDE, my favorite resource for learning Arduino IDE is to install like the ESP eighty two sixty six board and then look at the examples. So if you go mm. into Arduino IDE, um, actually, why don't we go ahead and switch over to my screen and maybe I'll show you guys. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I was uh, I was taking a test earlier. I didn't. I didn't. I you didn't are mean, a big jazz yeah, boy. I didn't need you guys to see that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> are you uh, sorry, guys? Didn't mean to broadcast my my favorite quiz over there. But if you wanted to take a really great test, then uh, you know you should figure out what kind of jazz boy you are. Okay. Anyway, so um, if you go into Arduino IDE and you have a certain board selected, what's really awesome is if you want to learn about it. Okay, I have the D1 Mini selected. I can go into uh, File Examples. And if I go down here, it says examples for the D1 Mini. So basically, like these are all of the different built-in examples that have lots of like sample code. So if I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to like blink uh, the light in Arduino, or I don't know how to blink without delay because I'm learning about Arduino and I keep getting bit by the watchdog timer, um, which is basically if you're doing anything involving Wi-Fi, then like there's a timer that's constantly running, and if you try to create a delay, it crashes everything. Mm. Um, so if you need to learn how to like do a blink on an LED without crashing everything, then look at this. Here's an example right here. I can click on this. It should open a new piece of code. And this is I can go ahead and flash this directly over to my D1 Mini because it has the pinouts correct. Everything is correctly set up for this board because this is an, an example for the board. So all right, like this allows me to blink without delay. Great, that's a pretty basic example. But if I want to get a bit more advanced, then I can go into examples and I can see, oh, SD card. Um, so if I want to use an SD card hat module, what, is, what does hat mean, Alex? Hats are like little modules that can stack on top of certain boards. It's short for hardware attached on top. Mm -hmm. So like for example, one of our favorite form factors is the D1 Mini, which we have attached on the back of this little cat PCB. And they basically sell hardware modules, the hats for these that stack directly on top and allow you to interface certain sensors in a very plug and play fashion. Exactly. So let's say that you have like a temperature sensor and you want it to log. You could literally buy a hat module put it on top of the D1 Mini, open up this example, and then go in and see, okay, like there, here's an example for the temperature sensor, here's an example for the SD card, and you can just basically merge those two things together and create something that logs the temperature to the SD card. So if you're just getting started with trying to learn this sort of thing, it's a really, really easy way to get correct working code examples without doing a single Google search just by looking through. And honestly, sometimes I just get ideas. Like yeah. when I went through here and I saw like, oh, ESP8266 Wi-Fi, like what does it do? Like what what examples have other people written? I was like, oh, here's an SSL certificate. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't even know that it could do uh, SSL. Here's HTTPS requests. Here's IPv6. Um, there's all there's Wi-Fi multi. Um, there's also a I believe there's like a Wi-Fi extender in here. 
Um, so if you want to learn how to use these features or if you want to, if you're doing security testing and you want to make this do a particular type of behavior, there's probably a sketch for that. So I, I don't know if a lot of people know that these uh, example sketches are in here. Um, I just like when I was in community college for electronics, like the, the professor showed us these and was really insistent that these were like an awesome thing that we should use. They're great. They're, they're seriously like they're the foundation of so much like great code because if you don't know how the underlying library works or how something is supposed to be set up, there's a really good chance that writing it from scratch you're going to mess it up. So this gives you a base to kind of go off of and I, I really have to say this is super useful. If for example we were using like the tiny GPS++ library we needed to test it so I was able to just you know do a basic example here and then by opening this up attaching the GPS to the correct pins and then setting it to go I was able to get the GPS working and know okay all the hardware is working it's just my code that has a problem. So um, yeah uh, very underrated but I, I feel good like kind of steering you guys in this direction if you're looking to get some inspiration um, and just good resources for Arduino IDE and learning it. Mm. Someone mentioned the ESP32 D1 Mini. Oh, Zam mentioned it, and he said it's specifically compatible with the ESP8266 hats. So if you look at oh, my it's screen, a little cursed, though. you can see some of the hats we were talking about earlier that would work like with the D1 Minis. And I suppose the ESP32s as well. But these plug and play modules are like super helpful for prototyping. It's just like a really, really easy way to get started interfacing with sensors, especially when you have like the example um, code that's already written for all of these. It's just as simple as like getting one of these hats and just plugging it on top, uploading the code, and you're pretty much good to go. Yeah, yeah. For example, like we wanted to do war driving, so we're like, all right, what do we need? We need a uh, we need an ESP8266 to get the Wi-Fi data and do the, the general program. We need an SD card module to log the data, and we need a GPS, and we need a LiPo, so a battery module, so we can use a battery for this. We just stuck all those hats together, but and then uh, with the exception of the GPS, which wasn't, unfortunately, there wasn't a GPS hat available. Um, so with a little bit of wiring, we were able to get all this just literally just stuck together and working um, mm -hmm. in not that long at all. So. Um, it's a fun ecosystem to prototype with because the next step obviously is just creating a printed circuit board that's custom like made yeah. for this purpose. But just by stacking stuff together, you can create a tall but workable uh, little prototype with very, very minimal effort and not even that much soldering, which I really, really like. Do you know any programming languages or what programming language do you use for hacking? Ah, so my most used programming language for anything is Python. Um, that is because I can wake up on a bad day and still write Python and not get angry. Whereas yeah. with C++, that is not true. Yeah, um, for web stuff, I also like Java. I don't like JavaScript, but I use it for <laughs> web stuff. That's a distinction I have to make. I would say Python's probably the most versatile for like automating stuff. Um, I think pretty much that's like, as much as you need to know, at least at a beginner level. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, knowing C++ allows you to do things like work with the D1 Mini, um, mm. which is a, a, you know, a really, really awesome thing to be able to work with Arduino and uh, hardware devices. Okay, if we switch over to my screen real quick, I just wanted to address also the D1 Mini version of the ESP32 that Zam mentioned. I, I have to say I hate this thing. Um, it like it's supposed to be pin compatible, but if you look at the sheer number of pins you have to solder on this thing, if you want to fully like break out all of the pins, I, I I know it's not necessarily necessary. And I have several of these. I just find that their failure rate is like super high for some reason. Really? Or maybe it's just the manufacturer I got them from. But like soldering all the pins onto this, if you actually wanted to use all of them, isn't it's just a nightmare. And making sure they're all straight, they're like all so close together. Um, I hate this board. That being said, again, I have like 50 of them, but I still hate them. Um, so yeah, there is like a, a D1 mini a sort of pin compatible version. You can see mm. it's like trying to be, it's it's trying to be pin compatible, but if I remember correctly, okay, like, okay, VCC ground. Yeah, okay, I guess that this is, this kid could be compatible. Mm. It just, uh, hmm. it just sketches me out. And the documentation is all weird. It doesn't use the same like D1, D2, whatever documentation. Yeah. It's just like, it's, this thing's weird, you guys. Um, I would much rather um, just like use a ESP32 S2. Um, I believe that that's the one that has like native USB, so you can just plug it in and it, it'll it'll just show up, like which is awesome and so much more useful than some of this other um, some of these other ways of connecting to it. But you know, um, the ESP32 is like obviously the more powerful, more versatile version of well, 
kind of microcontroller. It's not a version of the ESP8266. It's more the upgrade to it. But the newer versions of this are coming out with new capabilities that look really cool and awesome and are making a lot of people very excited. So um, it's kind of looking like it's going to replace the ESP8266 as a low cost uh, microcontroller that's super versatile, has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and allows you to do native USB. Because mm -hmm. all that stuff right now, you cannot get all together. All right. Maybe we should do another question from the uh, show. Sure. All right. <clears throat> uh, what is the model G-Shock that you wear in a lot of your videos? What? Oh, like, I mean, I guess all of them. Um, <laughs> I just, I just, I don't know this one. Um, I, <laughs> I'd have to look it up. I just uh, got like, so they have a, a black like G-Shock that's like like lowered because the castling on most of them is so big that it catches on things constantly. Mm. It's kind of cool because if you're ever like brawling with people or like otherwise like in people's space, like the castling actually is a huge deterrent for people to get close to you. But if you're just going about your life, having it like catch on things and knock things off is really lame. So this is just like the flat, like the flattened version of the, uh, I think it's like the, I don't know, military style, like blacked out one. That's cool. Um, yes. I've never gotten a watch-related question in my entire life. That's just like totally caught me off guard. I also like, I really like this watch, so like I'm kind of glad you asked because it's a great watch. I actually have the same one, but I didn't bring it on really? the trip with me. Yeah. No, it's sick. I really it's a like great this watch. watch. Yeah. yeah. It, it just like it feels very secure, and I haven't managed to kill it yet. So. Nice. I, I'm sorry. It's a cool watch. <laughs> what do you like? And and the other thing is like you know it doesn't die, <laughs> like after three days or something because it's not trying to be smart. So you know can't hack it. Or try, try, hack my watch. If you can hack my Casio watch, I'll be really impressed. Do you want to take this really aggressive question? Or do yeah, you please, okay. please. And can you narrate it in the voice, in the non-offensive voice that right. you think that the commenter left it in? Wow, this was so incorrect on so many levels. As a former international fraud investigator, this whole video was hogwash. Oh, okay, all right. First off, there's no need to swear, sir. <laughs> all right, go on. Incredible that you found a Roberto Sandoval from Mexico that was on Interpol and OFAC lists, dot, dot. I can tell you there are probably a 100,000 plus Roberto Sandovals on those lists, parentheses. Most likely over a million plus with a name that common. This is completely misleading and false on almost all levels. You guys really need to learn your craft and your sources before you make videos claiming you know what's going on. I love people that derive their entire self-worth from their former employment. Okay, so uh, let me just say that Roberto Sandoval was the former governor of Mexico who was charged with a bunch of money laundering, tax bribery, and, like, and other stuff. So he's currently on the Interpol red notice list. Now, in this demonstration, I was going from how we could take a photo from some sketchy guy to finding out that he's internationally wanted, which also includes information like his passport number, which is included in that red notice. So we went from a single photo, we used a series of tools to figure out other photos of that individual. From the, those other photos, we figured out their information. We were able to tie that into an international database, pull down information about whether or not they were wanted, and then we produced their passport number starting at a single photo. So like, okay, like maybe you know who Roberto Sandoval is, but in this case, you know, we just took a photo of a guy and we were able to show that through like, like tying a bunch of clues together, pivoting on them and finding a database that had more information about this man that, uh, yeah, like we were able to positively identify this man's passport number. So maybe, um, I don't know. Like, I, I just, I don't see anything wrong with this. So uh, that <laughs> what a what a very furious, uh, very furious state, statement question. Um, but yeah, no, I think this investigation is good. And um, what was he, a fraud investigator? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, he's a fraud, international fraud investigator. Okay, well that's, I'm not, oh, that's fine. How nice for you. He's probably um, also a hogwash uh, for, investigator. I also like, at what point during your fraud investigation would you be checking for an Interpol red notice? Like to see if like the person who's you're investigating the fraud of is like an international fugitive? Like, okay, whatever. Um, anyway, that investigation is great and it is not hogwash, sir. Take that back. All right, moving All on. Right. Next question. I'm no hacker, but why not search for the full name? It seems to me there's gotta be a lot of Roberto Sandoval's worldwide. Thank you for the for the voice on that. Um, <laughs> yes. So, uh, well, well, yes, there probably are a lot of people worldwide with that name. But the first step of this investigation was identifying more info information about this guy um, via his face. 
So we took his face, we did a facial recognition, recognition search, we found more photos of him, and then we were able to use a second search to take those photos of him and link them back to news articles that gave us more context clues about this man. So, um, Oh my gosh, Nick loves to do this investigation where there's like multiple athletes uh, that like have the same name and like in order to find the right one, like you have to like you create a Google dork that uh, omits like everybody that is not that person. And this is the same thing. Like once you know more context about the individual, you can include things like the town that they're in uh, and other sorts of words that will make sure you're getting the right person or slowly make sure you're getting rid of the wrong people by using the you know minus before a search term. So like, uh, right, if you have an individual and you just know their name and you do a search for them, you're gonna get everybody else who has that name as well. But if you have more information about them, like. I don't know, you did the investigation by using their face first and then found out a bunch of news articles about them committing fraud in a specific city, that would probably give you all the details you need in order to do a more constructed search that only returns the information you're looking for. So like, yeah, um, that, that's, how it, that's how it works. Question from Ty, what site do you use for your projects? Um, for publishing our projects or for finding projects? I would say that's a distinction that needs to be made, but for managing like our projects, um, usually GitHub for like uploading code, documentation. Um, actually, we recently started using the project feature inside of GitHub, which we also find very useful. It has like a whole Kanban board where you can just like organize loosely like your thoughts and project documentation and stuff like that. Um, for finding projects, I would say some of the sites we mentioned before, like Hackster, or Hackaday, or like Instructables or something. Um, okay, I have to address the, the question in the chat. Hogwarts is allowed, Hogwash is not allowed. Thank you for <laughs> the agree. question. I'm also gonna address Ashley. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, oh, there you go. All right, I, you all capped it, I heard you that time. Um, best Raspberry Pi, shouts Ashley. Um, for, for, well, I mean, for what? For, I do a lot of Wi-Fi hacking, so I actually really like the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus is like my all-time favorite Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi, um, just because it works really well. Um, actually, no, sorry, the 3B. The 3B specifically is the best Raspberry Pi of all time. Fight me. Um, I but, agree with that. But yeah, the Raspberry Pi 4 is more powerful if you're doing stuff that it, that needs more power, and there's a lot of advantages to it. The the problem for me is the, the wireless card that's a, like on board there is not as well supported for all the wacky wireless stuff I want to do. So for me, the Raspberry Pi 3B. Um, yeah, just because the wireless network adapter is super good, it's five gigahertz compatible, I believe. So that allows me to do some like five gigahertz hacking with that card if I want to. Um, all that stuff means it's an awesome device for security people if you want to do security stuff with it. Kali Linux on Thermux, question mark. Have that, you ever used Thermux? I have not. Me neither. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let you know when we do. Um, but that could be a good suggestion. Tell us, tell us why we should do a video on that, and we will. I promise. Cool. Oh, speaking of Kali Linux and the Raspberry Pi, we have a question from uh, one of your YouTube videos. Ah. I've been having issues with Kali on the Pi 4, where when I lost the Wi-Fi in a headless system and thus had to hard reboot. The kernel went to emergency mode, meaning I could not use the Pi on the go. Never seen this on Raspbian. Is this something you are aware of? Yes, this has happened to me multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I address it the very professional and streamlined way of just like completely reflashing and, and ignoring the problem. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so having a Raspberry Pi as a mobile like kit is great, except for the fact that they're very susceptible to like damaging their operating system if right. they are power cycled unexpectedly. So if you don't shut it down all the way, like it's really susceptible to corrupting the SD card. And if you corrupt the SD card, you got to plug it into a different uh, Linux system and FS check it. Yeah. Make sure you shut off like the Raspberry Pi before you unplug the SD card. That's been a problem for me before. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that has caused lots of... Um, things like these kernel panics you're seeing. Yeah, so what I, what I would do is I would literally back up my SD cards like before I would do something and I would have a, a an extra one with the same image saved on it. So if I fried hmm. my first one, I could pop in a backup one. That's how bad that's how bad it is. Like yeah. so like like physically having a like a a cloned backup card, it's really easy to just copy the image from one SD card to the other provided that they're the same size. So, I mean, if you just have an image that you really like for your Raspberry Pi that you have set up, then I would say like cloning it or making it easy to clone uh, to your card is the best way to do it because I haven't been able to 
make sure that the Raspberry Pi doesn't like d like damage the data on its SD card and make it so it's unbootable. Um, it just it just happens. Uh, another question, aggressively in all caps, we have, which Raspberry Pi board should I buy for GPU based attacks? Um. Mm. What? That's, that would not be. <laughs> I don't know about, like, okay. like to you to connect to Amazon, like to AWS with, like, or uh, to actually sure. do the cracking. Yeah. So, GPU based attacks are not the strong suit of the Raspberry Pi. In fact, it has like the hardware processor of like a Motorola phone from like the '90s or something like that. But um, you can use the Raspberry Pi to connect to a service like Google Colab, which I have covered in a video on Hack Five which will basically allow you to utilize um, two free NVIDIA GPUs from Google that they offer through this like machine learning service. And you can basically leverage this for things like hash cracking. So if you want to check that video out, I'll drop it in this chat. But um, Raspberry Pi, I guess like anything with Wi-Fi connectivity to be able to connect to Google Collab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you have a, a piece of hardware like the Raspberry Pi, like again, you're just going to get it really hot, and you're not going to get like you could just buy an old PC for the same price and get <laughs> right. like way superior performance in terms of like crack. Like it, it's just not a good platform for that. Really, it's good for collection, and it's good for like having a tiny, inexpensive little Linux computer that you know runs stuff. But it's it's definitely not like a GPU cracking computer. And if you if you try, you're just going to get a hot little Raspberry Pi. Um, oh, and also thank you for the compliment on the Hack Five editions. Um, we've been having some new people on Hack Five. Obviously, Alex has been debuting, and uh, we also have Nick from Nullbyte, who's also on the Hack Five channel. So we have some people in the chatters who's like, I can't believe that Shannon and Darren <laughs> are not the only hosts. This is the end. I will never return to this site. But also, some people have really liked the new faces, and like, frankly, we need to keep bringing up new people who have right. new ideas and new specialties. And you know, Alex here is absolutely crazy at what he's able to do with very limited resources. So uh, some of the stuff he even has made in the last like like three or four days has been pretty incredible. And we're going to be doing Hack 5 videos on. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, thank you. We appreciate the encouraging comments because other people are just like, I don't like your hoodie, kid. Why are you wearing a hoodie indoors? What is it, cold? It's too cold? For and it's just like, why are you menacing this teenager? Like he's trying to make hacking fun of you're yelling at him about being cold indoors. Um, how many stickers is too many stickers for a laptop? If you can't open it because the stickers have completely sealed it shut, that's too many stickers and you need to take some off. That's or, not true. That means you've reached like the peak state of hacker and you have like too much hacker energy to even like you just have to be run, messed with. You have to like run your computer headlessly because yeah. it's completely sealed shut with hacker computers. You're just too powerful at that point. Yeah, if I saw someone who like their computer was like <laughs> shrinked wrapped in, in stickers, I would be pretty I would be pretty um, intimidated by them. Yikes. Great question, though. All right. Uh, I was about, I was going to read this one, but there is a curse word. Oh. I well. agree with that, though. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're going to take another question from our YouTube, or our last live hacking community. Need a help. <laughs> all right, okay. we're here, we're here for that. We will give you a help. I have my, okay, wait, you can read it. Okay. I have buy a DigiSpark for Rubber Ducky, but it take five sec fr first to start. How to make it two or three sec? Um, great question. Time um, dilation. You would have to enter like a time warp. We don't have the technology, is what yeah. Alex is saying. So um, the DigiSpark is a extremely low cost uh, microcontroller that's based on like the ATtiny85 that allows you to uh, you know plug this in and then start up and do human interface device things. So it can op operate like a um, like a USB rubber ducky, sort of, but with a little bit more work. So the mm. other caveat on this is like it, the, the spacing on the traces um, to fit into the USB slot is not always gonna work. For some reason, some computers have USB traces that are just a little bit off from it. So you'll find that like the DigiSpark just doesn't work in some computers or like there's just lots of other like weird quirks with it. Now, one of the quirks is like it takes a, a second to start up sometimes and like, you can reduce that to a certain point, but really not that much more because it's just a tiny little microcontroller that has to do a bunch of stuff that like it doesn't want to do and you're forcing it to. Yeah. So if you want something that's going to start up a bit more quickly, there's other platforms like um, the Wi-Fi Duck um, is one in particular that is able to, as soon as it starts up, just instantly run its code. Well, 
Okay, as soon as it starts up, which is probably like a second or so, then run its code, um, or you can connect to it and run code arbitrarily. Um, so like that, that's a more sophisticated setup. It uses um, like a ESP8266 and then a, oh my God, a Spark Fun Pro Micro. So if you mm. have those two components, you can solder them together on a PCB or you can, you know, breadboard them or whatever, and you can get uh, a bit more uh, powerful version of the um, DigiSpark. I just find that the DigiSpark like is quite slow, and like I I'm able to buy them for like eighty cents on AliExpress, and like I still am sometimes just like hmm, this thing's barely worth it because you'll just find that like lots of them just do not work when you get them. Um, so a little awkward, but uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a problem with uh, um, using these really really low cost like eighty cent electronics. It's like sometimes they just aren't the best. Uh, can you make a USB rubber ducky out of a normal USB? Wait, I want to switch over to my screen real quick oh, please, before yeah. we address that question. Yeah. So if you want to check out the Wi-Fi duck that Cody was actually talking about, you can find it on the website at hackerinterchange.com mm -hmm. under their shop. So this is actually a pre-soldered kit that comes with both the ESP8266 and the Pro Micro stack. Mm -hmm. And as Cody said, this will give you access to things like keystroke injection, like right off the bat, you can program it to just like run a script. Um, since it also has Wi-Fi connectivity, you can connect to its like access point remotely and launch like keystroke attacks, um, stuff like that. And it comes with a really cool streamlined interface that just looks like really slick and it's super easy to work with. Yeah, so absolutely. So you can check that out and I'll drop it in the chat if you're interested in picking one of these up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, really like uh, the Wi-Fi dock. I think it's one of the coolest projects and I've developed some stuff for it. For example, you can save scripts in the Wi-Fi dock and then have like a Python script on your computer that just is basically waiting for the Wi-Fi duck to come up. So as soon as uh, the Wi-Fi duck powers itself up and creates the access point, it'll immediately send like an HTTP, re it'll connect and send an HTTP request to the duck that tells it to run a specific script. So you can really cut down the, the time necessary to like pick a specific script and run it by like having it like basically running before you plug in the duck and then the instant it comes up, your computer can send a request and trigger a specific script. So it's super, super cool. Like I've just like, really enjoyed working on this platform and trying to reduce the amount of time it takes to run a, a custom script. Because that's really what's so cool about it, is getting to pick the script, you know, basically up to the moment that you plug it in. Mm. PSA, I decided to quit learning hacking. No, why? Yeah. That's, why would you do that? That's sad. There's uh, very <laughs> few things that are as interesting. But, uh, you know, sometimes you got to take a break, I guess. Can you make a rubber ducky out of a normal USB? Uh. <laughs> I've tried that. There was this really sketchy hack that I did that only worked on like, I forget how I did it, but it only worked on like Windows 7 with like an <laughs> auto run thing. Um, basically, no, it will not work because normal USB de USB devices will pop up as USBs and this will not bypass like the same uh, thing that the USB rubber ducky does because it actually pops up as like an HID device and it looks like a keyboard, which most computers will trust by default, allowing it to basically like inject keystrokes and stuff like that. But since the fingerprint of a USB device is different, computers will not allow this to be recognized and to run um, like unauthorized scripts just like right <laughs> off the bat. So if you switch over to my screen, um, there, so there is a way to do this. Um, I, I, and it, it basically it relies on you getting lucky and having a USB stick that has a compatible microcontroller. Ooh. So like there are some USB sticks that can be reprogrammed. Um, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of nonsense. I've never done because it's way harder than <laughs> buying one that is compatible. Right. You can like reflash it and tell it to do a bunch of stuff, and you have to. It, it, this it is a pain. So yes, you can. Um, is is it likely that you have one right now that's compatible? No, it's not. Um, I've been through a bunch of them and I have found that most low end ones are not, you, you can't do this because I, one time I opened up, uh, I opened up one of these and it was literally just an SD card soldered to a bunch of traces. So like, you know, like it's all over the map with like what these things are under the hood. So the likelihood that you would have a normal USB stick, you could just flash into a bad USB device is probably pretty low. If you went and like found one specifically that supported this, you could buy one and then flash it. But at that point you might as well just get a DigiSpark because like it right. would be cheaper and you could buy 10 of them and you would know that they would work. Not to mention the Wi-Fi duck is like just way more cooler than this project. Cause it's also Wi-Fi controlled. You can 
load scripts on it without having to like jankily solder together or like whatever modifications you have to do to this thing to get it to work. You have to like flash in like Virtual Studio and like there's a bunch of stuff. And this is also like a kind of, I believe it's kind of an old guide because this is like an older way of doing this. Hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, this was in 2016. So um, yeah, like technically yes, um, but for the average person, no. So yes, but also no. Question from the real Zam. Alex, do you have more than one outfit? Uh, Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> this is my sort of like stylistic option. It's it very much fits like the hacker stereotype. Um, I do have more than one outfit though. I'll make sure to diversify a little. Yeah, and time. please, Alex is recovering from a very <laughs> bad burn from a um, anime pillow he was sleeping with. So, yeah, come you on. know the the lipo battery caught fire, and like we're just waiting for the skin to regrow. So until then, Alex will be in his hoodie. It's his yep. prosthetic skin. It also helps me like it's a I, medical device. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the hoodie is a medical <laughs> device. Um, Raspberry Pico is rubber ducky. I mean, it could be. Um, yeah, it's actually really great for like HID stuff, and I've seen a ton of like keyboard platforms that are now based off it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that's like really popular right now, but a ton of people are just making. Um, like macro keyboards using the Raspberry Pi Pico. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, are they like cursed or good? Uh, they're a bit excessive because I feel like things like the Pro Micro can already do that for like a fraction of the cost. They do look pretty though, and I guess I could take a look at some of them that we can pull up in a sec. Hmm. Um, okay, so some other questions. Um, actually, yeah, I really want a Raspberry Pi Pico. So if you guys are interested in like some Raspberry Pi Pico based like guides or just exploration or whatever, let's, let us know. We'll check it out. I've shied away from it because I mostly do Wi-Fi hacking stuff. And since it doesn't have Wi-Fi, I immediately lost interest in it. But you know, a lot of cool people have been making stuff. Oh, oh look yeah. at that, Alex. Yeah, there's a ton of... Let's switch over to your screen, yeah. Yeah, in fact, like on, the only projects I've seen so far featuring the Raspberry Pi Pico have just been like macro keyboards. And it looks like there's even a few commercial products for it, like this um, Pi Maroni expansion thing with RGB LEDs. Uh, you have more macro keyboards, DIY macro keys, stuff like that. Um, yeah, we should mess around with it for HID-based attacks in future videos. I don't know the complete like expanse of its use cases if it can like emulate like uh, Ethernet or stuff like that, but that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that actually sounds fun. Do we have any more questions from the uh, uh, let me show? Take a look. Something not clear to me. All At right. 1630, you said you have Cyberdyne running. So does this mean you are near that Wi-Fi network or did he create a fake ne Wi-Fi network? Uh, there's a whole missing piece, etc., cetera, et cetera. Little confusing, demo. All right, all right. <laughs> so that was on my how hackers capture Wi-Fi passwords from smartphones. Um, and yeah, so no, no, no. Okay, so they, they didn't understand. Um, so the whole point was like I was hunting employees from Cyberdyne so that I could try to get the Cyberdyne Wi-Fi password. So the way that I was doing that was I was creating a fake Cyberdyne uh, Wi-Fi network after using wiggle.net to look up their like address and then find what the name of their office Wi-Fi was. So in that case, I was creating a fake network and waiting for anybody to try to connect to it. And if they tried to connect to it, then it was usually a phone automatically doing so based off of already having that network stored in their preferred network settings. So in that case, then the phone would just automatically attempt to join and I would know, hey, somebody that's joined the Cyberdyne network before is in the area. So it was basically um, being using a fake network as a detection method for somebody that's joined a particular Wi-Fi network of interest before, in this case, somebody that worked at a sketchy you know, company that makes Terminators. Cool. We have a question from the future regarding the Raspberry Pi 400 and if it's any good for uh, Wi-Fi attacks. So hmm. the Raspberry Pi 400 hasn't been released yet, but that's I untrue. Figure, I have one upstairs. Do you really? I sure do. Dang. Okay. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that's the keyboard one. Yeah, it has been released for a while. Oh, what? I was yeah. being sarcastic. I thought they misspelled Raspberry Pi 4. No, no 400. What the heck? Yeah. Sorry. What is that? Oh my god, I'm so sorry. What are you talking about? <laughs> we have a live stream on. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I'll no way. let me see if I can pull it up. Um, so the oh my god, Pi four hundred is. Uh, we actually what? talked a lot of smack about this too. Um, this looks so weird. I've never seen this thing. 
Here we go, yeah. Um, go ahead and switch over to my screen. So this is the Raspberry Pi 400. Um, this is what I currently have Manjaro Mon Mon running on upstairs. Um, we've used it on a couple of the streams, and my primary complaint is um, is is such. Why would you make something that has like heck? all the interfaces necessary to run a computer and then omit the trackpad? <laughs> Why? This Why? Is, mm. Why? Um, so basically, like, if you want to run this, uh, if you want to run an operating system on this that isn't like terminal only, you gotta have like, you know, a screen of some sort, and then a mouse. Why? Um, whatever. I've, I've, I've already. I'm, I'm tired. Uh, but like, the worst part about using a Raspberry Pi is all the peripherals that you need. So they were just like, oh yeah, let's just get rid of the peripherals. Let's, let's just put it inside a peripheral. But like, they didn't realize that like most of the people that access a Raspberry Pi remotely are using one of these like keyboard mouse combinations that has a trackpad on the side, a mm. and it's like so lame that they didn't include one. I, I'm, I'm still not over that. So um, yes, we have a Raspberry Pi 400. I've used it for Wi-Fi hacking, and no, it is not good for that. And the reason is the internal wireless card is not compatible with Kali Linux or, or just monitor mode in general. So because they went with a wireless card that is not supported, you will need to use one of its USB ports to put in a wireless network adapter. That means that you, I mean, you could use the internal wireless card as a C2 channel, so you could use it as a way of connecting to and controlling the Raspberry Pi. So maybe that's not a bad idea. Um, but I mean, the, the, I just, what it's almost perfect for like taking on the go except for the fact that you need a stupid mouse like it just it's so dumb and i'm still so mad about it so yeah like pack your mouse and then go use the raspberry pi 400 to uh to go hacking except for the fact that one of the usb ports is going to be taken up by the stupid mouse and the second one is going to be taken up by the usb uh or the usb based wireless network adapter because the onboard one doesn't work for hacking Personally, I would rather take a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus and take, and then just have, uh, sorry, Raspberry Pi 3B, 3B, um, and then have <laughs> uh, the Bluetooth keyboard like mouse combination. Because at least I only have one peripheral then. Like, so do I like the Raspberry Pi 400? Like, sort of. Do I think they could have done it better? Yes. But um, is it good for Wi-Fi hacking? No. <laughs> it looks very confusing. But I guess like if you, if you're just using like terminal or something like a completely terminal based operating system like maybe but it's like a weird combination of like keyboard and computer that i don't like i would prefer that they just let me <laughs> pick one that has the trackpad and the clicker on it because it's so annoying to me that i, I still have basically the, the same setup as any other raspberry pi only they've now stuck one thing inside the keyboard which already was smaller and easier to carry when it was integrated with the with the trackpad and mouse Ah, so um, I'm not a huge fan of the Raspberry Pi 400. I think the design is stupid, and um, that it could have been, been been better. And that in most cases, I would rather just have a little Raspberry Pi um, and a separate keyboard because like this isn't the keyboard I would have picked. Cool. But I mean, if it's gonna live on, if like me, it's gonna live on your desk and just monitor like your 3D prints and, and other stuff and run Manjaro. It's fine. It's just like, you know, the fact that it has USB ports is cool until you need to use basically all of them because of the lack of compatible wireless network adapter or mouse. So that's my opinion on that. What's your favorite network vulnerability scanner and why? I don't have one because I don't do network vulnerability scans. Um, hmm. I guess I'll, I'm going to say Nmap, and the reason why is because it has lots of different plugins. But I, I am not a pen tester, so I do not generally do vulnerability scans. If uh, back when I did, I would use Nikto, if hmm. that if, uh, if that grabs you. Um, but uh, seeing as I don't do vulnerability scans on like a daily basis, and I'm pretty highly specialized when it comes to like Wi-Fi stuff. Um, you know, vulnerability scans for me are like router exploit, where I'm like looking at an embedded device to see if I'm able to like break into a, a any further into a wireless network I've gained access to. I don't really do like domain vulnerability scans or anything like that. So unfortunately, I can't give you a good recommendation <laughs> other than that um, Nmap has a lot of vulnerability like scripts that you can run. So Nmap scripts are actually really useful for this sort of thing. Cody, is Nick your son? Nick is my son. Nick is one of my sons. I have I have many sons, and Nick is one of them. Your official son is not here, but he's yeah. a fat nugget. Yeah, and I, I have a robot son, which is a, a Roomba with googly eyes on it. I have, yeah, I have this many son sons. This son, too. Yeah. This one's the Wi-Fi nugget. I don't know if you can see him, but he's a little cat. <laughs> <laughs> Your son's son. <laughs> 
What a what a great question. I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna forward this on to Nick. I'm sh I'm sure he will really enjoy this question. Nick will also enjoy this comment on the YouTube channel. Anybody know Nick's info? Heart emoji. Wow. Okay. Well, Nick is very busy right now. But if you want to get in touch with him, you can leave him a comment on his on the Pack Vibe <laughs> video because I know he reads them every day to gas himself up to go to work. So, excellent. <laughs> but oh, also, if you wanna, if you actually wanna get in touch with Nick, you can find him on Twitter. I don't think he checks it a ton, but he does send me memes on there sometimes. Um, he's at just at Nick Godshaw um, on Twitter. Nice. Someone wants to know if you can plug in an external GPU to the Raspberry Pi. I've done that on a laptop, specifically a Dell XPS, to run a Wi-Fi cracking thing. I don't know about the Raspberry Pi. Although I do know it's USB-C compatible and I've seen it uh, tethered to like smartphones before. So maybe, and we'll look into that. <laughs> uh, someone, uh, okay, cool. Um, thanks for keeping the hogwash and balderdash to a minimum. We try, and yet we get accusations to the contrary. So it's good to see that someone thinks we are being mindful of our balderdash. <laughs> good. All right, I think that we that's pretty much all the time we have for today. If you've got any burning questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat because we've got a couple more minutes. But yeah, overall, I think that that was a, a good chat session. And again, we'll also be going back to our war driving and drone stuff. So if you have any questions about that, we're going to be doing a full on stream about that very soon. So you'll be able to see how you can do this too and what you can do with the data. So got any questions that weren't answered here or if you're watching later on you can feel free to drop them on the youtube channel and we will make sure they get answered next time uh, we didn't have any more from the channel did we we had two. Uh, oh i guess we did we did out. yeah we also have a very pressing question from the chat which one cody was wrong about the jurassic park uh, CGI in the computer. It was in fact wow. a real thing. I don't see. It's at the very top of the chat. I don't see it. Yeah, sorry. I, I don't see that question. So I guess I can't take that. Yeah. Something about me being wrong. I guess. <laughs> Doesn't sound Pathetic. likely. Can't see it. So I'm gonna assume this is some sort of some sort of hoax. Actually, Zam did find out that um, this is like some w really weird like uh, old like Visual browser station. system that I. Mm. Um, I stand by my statement that uh, I, I said that it looked like a putt putt golf course, <laughs> which I stand by. So like I didn't say anything inaccurate. Um, I was not wrong. It does look like a putt putt golf course, and that's why we don't use that file system anymore. All right, moving on. I don't think it's a good idea for you to end the live. People need you. I know. Thank you. And I also appreci appreciate you putting that in um, in uh, not all caps. My <laughs> eardrums are already blasted enough. All right, no, no more questions from the show? Uh, let me check. Oh, can you guys make a video of Lemon, please, guys? I really need it, and for Windows, too. Sure, I, I'm not familiar with that tool. Have you heard of Lemon? We could check it out and potentially cover I it, have... but no. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. This makes me suspicious. Uh, I don't see any new questions, but someone says that the shorter format videos. That's not a question. That's just Michael <laughs> good patting himself information. on the back. Yeah, what the heck, Michael? Okay, so Michael started making some new shorter format videos. You might have noticed them on the channel. I think that they're good, because I approve them. Um, but uh, if you want to pat Michael, Michael on the back, go ahead and watch those and leave a nice comment, because I don't. that last one was just put in there by Michael to, to let us know he's doing a good job. So good job, Michael. Everybody, everybody say good job, Michael. All right. Uh, we have a pretty generic question. Any good ESP8266 sites? Um, not specifically oriented towards ESP8266 as far as I'm aware of. Random nerd tutorials. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. I've pulled Rui, a lot of information Rui from Rui that. Sanchez at Random Nerd Tutorials like, focuses on the ESP8266 and the ESP32. And um, his, pro his tutorials are excellent. I've learned a ton about them. His sample code is great. So if you want to find some really awesome projects for the ESP8266, Random Nerd Tutorials is one of my favorite go-tos. -to, go go -tos. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. Cool. Okay. I think that's all we... Uh, what about Cubes, Cubes OS? OS? You can check hey. out... You can check out... We have a whole stream on that, uh, on that guy. So if you want to see more on Cubes OS, feel free to check that one out because I don't use it because it's a little bit much. But, <laughs> you know, we know people that do. So we, we managed to get a stream on that. So you can check that one out. I'm uh, sure someone will drop that in the chat. But uh, all right. So that's all the time we have today. Make sure to drop your questions on the YouTube channel if you didn't get them answered. And of course, drop by the next live stream next week to get your questions answered if you have one you just want to be on the, uh, the stream for.
And uh, yeah, that's it. We will talk to you guys next time. Uh, Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you to everybody in the live chat. And of course, thank you to Zam for moderating. Uh, we always appreciate having you here. We'll see you all next time. Bye.